Hey now, thanks to your phenomenal support of us on kickstarter.com and thanks to our colourful, interesting, funny guests, the big interview marches on. Here's Terry. But before we speak about Mr. Butcher, let's just say a couple of things. Firstly, thank you for every cent, dollar, dime, euro, every pound that you've pledged on kickstarter.com to support this podcast, which has given us all so much enjoyment. The campaign on kickstarter.com, look for the big interview, finishes at 8am on Wednesday, November 18th. On which subject, a lot of you who want to come to fiestas but haven't yet bought tickets are legitimately enough asking for calendar dates. We've got them. In Aberdeen, the fiestas on Friday, February the 5th. In Glasgow, Friday, February 19th. In Dublin, Friday, March 4th. In London, Friday, March 25th. It'll be an evening where football questions will be answered. Some of the off-mic discussions, none too embarrassing, that we've had with our big interview guests will be shared. There'll be music. I'll sign books. Yes, you've insisted there'll be a bar, so I suppose there'll have to be a bar in all of the venues. There are other rewards still available. Kickstarter.com. They're called stretch goals once we go beyond our original target. I don't really know what that's meant to mean, stretch goals. There's no birth involved. But what we will do is bring you the big interview more regularly. We'll be more ambitious in where we travel to get our guests. Many of you have asked for Swedish, Danish, French footballers, guys who are now playing in America. What we will do is try to be more able to fulfill your wishes, given that we've got the financial support. Terry Butcher was an ideal candidate for the big interview because ever since I've known him, and the first time we really got to know each other was in 1998, both in La Manga and Casablanca, as England prepared for the World Cup in France. I think he was a defender of much more skill, particularly in his passing, his left-footed passing, than people remember because he was iconic for his belligerence, his captaincy, his I-will-not-be-defeated persona, when in fact he could really play. Terry's also funny. He's got an acute memory for... Uh, a phrase I use again, a football life well spent. He played at the highest level. He won important trophies. But more than that, he always had a concept of what was interesting or funny in his life. And he's remembered everything. For that reason, we get stories about heavy metal, hypnotherapy. Um, there's mention of the joy he takes in studying an Italian footballer right down the back of his Achilles. Yes, Matt Terry is in there too. We'll talk about the young Terry who was too small to see over the fence of Portman Road and his dad brought him a milk crate to stand on. And we'll talk about Ipswich, Bobby Robson's team that played one style in bewitching Britain, I think, in 1978 to win the FA Cup final against Arsenal. The cigar incident thereafter, but also the way in which Franz Tyson and Arnold Muren meant that the Ipswich of Bobby Robson had to change. Just a little note. This interview was so long, so much fun that it's in two parts. This is part one and it's the shorter of two. But trust me, you've listened in so far. Join us for both parts. I think you're going to lap it up. Enjoy. Terry Butcher, it's good to have you in the city for which you're probably most famous. Town is town, it's not a city. In the town, in the no. Ipswich, Ipswich town, town. Which you but the question that I've got the privilege of asking you, which the world has always wanted to ask, and I think bugs you and asks you everywhere you go. What was your favourite heavy metal concert that you've ever been at? Good question. Yeah. I went to, um, after the 1990 World Cup, I went to the Playhouse in Edinburgh with Iron Maiden. And um, well, I met them backstage before, because I know them very well. Oh, really? And, um, and then watched the concert and then ended up going on stage and uh, with the roadies and then singing the number. <laughs> Heaven can wait, I think it was. No way. And we went on there. Yeah, it was, it was just the one word of oh. And we went oh, oh, oh. And that. So, so we sang loads of that and then went off again quickly. And then went back uh, backstage afterwards and I presented Steve Harris, the bass guitarist, with one of my World Cup shirts from 1990. So I went to the, obviously living in Ipswich now, near Ipswich now, that was where the sort of the basis of heavy metal. I always liked heavy metal before, but Paul Mariner got me onto heavy metal big time, uh -huh. and he introduced me to like Ian Gillan as well. Ah, oh, yeah, like this. classic. We, we we watched a lot of concerts together, me and Mariner. And um, so, I just was a scene where where, where where it all began, really. Good, good groups would come and play here. Yeah, good groups would come. I mean, Hawkwind. I don't class them as a good group, but they came and Meatloaf, Saxon, Def Leppard, Kiss, yeah. all these sort of groups they came, came along. Yeah, they all came along. It's it all part of the circuit of the British circuit. 
but so they came along and it was normally packed and really really good so I got a good affinity with uh, with Iron Maiden Mark Avery is one of the one of the guys on the the management team not not so much the concert but I got invited after 1990 I got invited to go to Italy because they were launching one of their albums in Italy and they were playing a football game because they all love the football yeah Steve Harris is, a, is an Irons fan, a big West Ham fan. Um, there's, there's two stories to this, because the first one was they asked me to go to, into Europe to play. So they flew me out, and Neil Webb out, because Neil's a heavy metal man as well, and Maris, and we were to play against Alto Bellis and Gentiles and all these people out there. Yes, please. Um, in a, in a sort of charity game. Yeah. So we ended up going out there and playing the game. And uh, we won 7-1. It was unbelievable. <laughs> I, I played against Alto Belli before, yeah. in, in 1985, I think it was, Italy, in, in Mexico. And a friendly, and um, it was nice to play against him again. He hadn't put any weight on and things like this. But the, the best thing in the game was I actually went down the back of an Italian player's Achilles tendon. Now that may sound a bit brutal, but it was it was heaven to me because I'd missed that. I hadn't been able to do that for years. <laughs> so it, it was by accident, but it felt good, I must say. <laughs> and this this player had to be taken off, off <laughs> which was even better. I mean, so the, the Iron Maiden boys are there, right? Well, they're well, going it. absolutely mad, aren't they? Absolutely loved it. Yeah, <laughs> I thought it was one of the best things I'd ever seen. <laughs> I just went right down the back of his Achilles and I felt it as well. I was heavy like, metal studs. Oh, heavy metal studs, yeah. <laughs> heavy metal thunder, yeah. So that, that was the other one. And the one as well, they were launching another, another album and they, um, I got the invitation through Mark Avery to fly down to Stansted. And Mark, Steve uh, Harris, the bass guitar, lives near Stansted Airport. So flew down there. Maris was there as well, Neil Webb, as usual, usual boys. Um, he's got a, Steve Harris has got a recording studio in his grounds, he's got a pub in his grounds, and he's also got uh, a football pitch. So we ended up playing the football game in he's front of all these, all these black leather fans that were Iron Maiden people who I think the dress of the day was black leather. So everybody was like, oh, the, all the, the long hair, you couldn't tell which were men or women because of the long hair. But anyway, <laughs> we played the game and it was a great game of football. And I did something that I was always wanted to do in football, my football career, I've only done it once. And I did it that afternoon. I walked off the pitch into the bar of the pub with my football boots on and down to Ponta Lager. <laughs> I've always wanted to do that. And it was just incredible. We had a great night. So it was, I've got a lot of good memories of Iron Maiden. This is strange. Having played for the Cobbles Club yeah. and having played in a certain era at Vasco Rangers, there must have been some opportunity to walk off a game and drink a pint straight down before you had to do it with... No, I, my career at Rangers didn't overlap with Gaza. Had I been with Gaza, we probably, that probably, probably wouldn't have been the case. Been. But uh, yeah, you, know, you never get the chance to do that. But it was just a wonderful occasion. And you know, they're obviously with the, with the group playing as well, not members of the group play, but you know, they're still my favourite group and I always will be. Well, it, those who've had the bad luck to have to listen to my parts of the big interview over the last few months know that I'm, I'm obsessed by music. Music and football would be up there. Yes. And it, they're things that make life worth living. They make like more fun they bring out your character and they make me bubble with enthusiasm and also I love creativity I love people who can create music they've, they've got my total respect but the two things I'd like to know is what is it about metal that, that's right for you and were you able to play it in dressing rooms during your career you, because I know the rubbish that they play now oh, I mean appalling stuff oh there they should, they should be punches thrown about hip they hop be, and beat don't, don't pop let's, and let's not even call it. Oh, okay. give it a name let's yeah. not talk about it but were you allowed to metal out some of your dressing rooms or not or no not really no because in that, in that era I mean it's only at the, the latter stages of my career when the boom box or the the, yeah. big, the big machines were coming into the dressing rooms and Wimbledon were the ones down south with Vinnie Jones and everyone else like that, they, they, they got the thing going. And the reason that they did, I think one of the reasons it was said was that it got everybody together rather than chat and talk, you know, it, it gave an atmosphere in the yeah. dressing room, we can understand that. Yeah. But no, I've never been able to do that. And I did threaten every team I've been at, I haven't been there long enough, but every team I've been there, I've always said, I'll, I've said, I'll do my team talk, say my things and then get out because the music goes on. It's, a, it's an indication that, you know, get out Gaffer, you're off, you know, the music's on now. I said, one day I'm going to play my music on there. But I think... So you'll be the only one left in the dressing room the players yeah, all go well, out. Probably, yeah. I should actually put it on while they're warming up. But the, the, for me, anyway, the thing that gets me going on for a game would be heavy metal. Yeah. You know, like when you're driving in a car and you, yeah. and you put on uh, Planet Rock or something like that, you put on your, on your CDs and things like this, it makes me actually put my foot down on the accelerator quicker. So it's not a good thing to drive to, I yeah. feel, because you, 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 you know, you're like, whoosh, and you, you love the speed. Is it the energy of the music? The energy, yeah. yeah. yeah the energy, so... The thing that I had in the 1986 World Cup in particular, because we had cassettes in those days, and other young kids, and I well, what on earth were they? But we had cassettes. And I had a cassette of uh, hypnotherapy tapes. 
and I, I, I put that on. I would go into the, into the toilet before games, into the cubicles, and sit there and put my headphones on. No one else would do it. There was no music because the warm-ups weren't that controlled and it was up to you whether you warmed up or not. So I would go in the toilet, put the headphones on, and it was, it was a lovely guy, Doc Lewis, who lives in Felixstone nearby. And he was very, very good with hypnotherapy and he would take me away to Desert Island. He put stitches in my eye once after a game and I didn't have any anesthetic. I never felt it go in. I just said, well, you're going to start doing the stitches. And he said, no, I finished. I put three in. I said, you're joking. He said, I never felt a thing because he rubbed it and took me away to a Desert Island, mm -hmm. took my mind away. Mm -hmm. So I listened to these tapes and it was, it was nice music, but what it would do, it would tell me, well, positive things. Mm -hmm. It would tell me about how to, how to program your mind. Because when you, you go to the games as a player, you get there about 2 o'clock, it's a 3 o'clock kickoff, and you've got sweaty armpits or you feel tired and you know, your headaches and all that sort of thing. That's your adrenaline's coming too quick. So mm -hmm. you've got to try and control that. Yep. And these hypnotherapy tapes did just that. Imagine your body's like a, like a, a big cylinder and it's got a bubbly f uh, liquid in it, which is your nerves, your anxieties. Mm -hmm. And the taps are on your fingers and on your toes. So you open the taps up and let it drain away. And you see it drain away. And they close the taps, and there's a big tap inside you. See it turned on, and it's filling up with your adrenaline. And this is, this is about 10 to 3. Mm -hmm. It's just filling up your adrenaline. So like, and it's filled up, filled up, filled up, filled up. Now, how do you feel? And you, I was literally breaking doors down to get out onto the pitch because I was ready to go. It was before its time in many ways, but it was really good for me. Well, you see, that without knowing you terrifically well, we did spend some time on the road together where you were a BBC analyst, I mean, particularly in Casablanca with England in 19, the build-up to 98, which we'll come back to. But the little I did know of you, I, I learned very quickly not to categorise you as the, as the player I saw, you know, because you're a man of humour and a man of, you're very open, you're very intelligent, and you haven't surprised you're me. You're talking about me? I am oh, right, talking right. about you. No, this is, this, is the, this is the part where we don't joke around for 10 oh, seconds, okay. for 10 seconds or so. But you've still surprised me that you, you were that far up ahead and that in an environment because football is an environment where people will take the piss out of you we're doing something you've got to be not only strong physically and as a leader but you've got to be strong about your own self-confidence to do something different and in those days that would have been quite different and we, it's, this is not an identical example but when we talked to Chris Waddle about the time when when he suffered depression where he was very down he, he said at that stage in football you couldn't go and talk to people about it because it was seen as a sign of weakness I'm not saying that listening to hypnotherapy would have been seen as a sign of weakness, but you would have encountered in that era people who just didn't understand it at all. What helped you find that as, as a useful tool for you, and who helped you find it, and, and did, how did other people accept it? Well, it was, it was in 86 when we were out in, in Mexico that I'd sit by the pool with free time because we weren't allowed to sit there that long because it was, it was very hot. But I'd sit by the, and listen to my hypnotherapy tapes, and there were all different ones, you know, positives and after games and all this sort of thing. So you'd, I'd sit there listening, and everybody thought I was listening to heavy metal because they knew I liked heavy metal. And I just, I was just no. And you'd actually give them to people to listen to. Really, you could, you could share. Yeah, you share, and they, they loved them. They loved it. They, it was really good. It was good because Doc Lewis used to help with, with children that were wet, were wet their beds or had anxiety problems, and, and he would help like that. And I, I gave one to my, my tape to my mum, and she had problems sleeping, and she, she, was, she was great after that, and things like that. Wow. So, yeah, you probably could say it was some stage ahead, but that was just, just seemed natural to me that, that I, I, I got that, and I was able to do that. The thing about me was being a little bit different was I'm six foot four, I'm not the quickest guy in the world, but I was very comfortable on the ball because that was ingrained at Ipswich and with Bobby Robson and Bobby Ferguson, Charlie Woods, the coaches there. They made sure that I had a good feeling of the ball. So the ball was my friend, it wasn't an enemy. And I wasn't a six foot four centre half, they would just kick it out of play, things like this. I was, I'm not sure cultured, I wouldn't say cultured, but I was, I, I could pass the ball. Yeah. And then when Ray Wilkins kept coming back and giving me the ball, I wouldn't give it to him because I could do <laughs> what Ray Wilkins could do, to in all fairness. But I always knew I was a little bit different in many respects as having confidence on the ball and able to pass the ball. It's from that that you sort of think, well, I've tried something different, it seems natural to me, let's go with it and let's, let's progress it. And I, I took it up to Rangers as well and there, I enjoyed it there as well. And then the music came into the dressing rooms and all different kinds of aspects and then you're looking at psychologists and all that sort of thing, which didn't really come into effect when I was playing. Bobby Robson had two psychologists that, that were doing a six months trial at Ipswich many, many years before that. And they, they came to Liverpool to watch the, the game and and they, they'd been with us for six months and they obviously became part of the furniture. So Bobby did his pre-match talk at Liverpool in the hotel 
and we never won at Liverpool. We drew occasionally, but never won. And Bobby used to start this team talk with, uh, right lads, when you go a goal down, this is what I want you to do. <laughs> and it's like, if, we're all used to that, but we all do what Bobby meant. So it wasn't a problem for us, and it wasn't negative for us, but the, you could see the psychologists go, oh my God, <laughs> well, there's a bit of work to be done here. So psychologists, we just started to come into, into football then. So yeah, it was, it was part of a, of a real good era in terms of all different kinds of things were happening, not just on the pitch, but off it. Well, I think you could hear the admiration in my voice because I think that, I think we've legitimately in Britain been accused of being a little bit slow to open ourselves up to other techniques and other ideas from which you, you definitely can learn. And I think that there's nothing wrong with our warrior-like psychology throughout the history of European football. British clubs have been very nearly the most successful nation, but we were definitely slow to say that we needed to learn anything from anybody. And therefore, I, you know, I liked hearing that. And I also think that it's difficult to show being different in football because it's a very... It's a very jealous, very small-minded atmosphere sometimes, particularly if things aren't going well. It's, not, it's different now, isn't it? Because you, you've got centre-halves with, their, with the socks over their knees and they've got earrings and tattoos and big bushy hair and all this sort of thing. It is, if you're different now, it's good. That seems to be, that seems to be the, the, the common thing. In our days, in 20, 30, 40 years ago, you didn't want to be different. You wanted yeah. to be the same. You wanted to be the same thing and, and not stereotyped or pigeonholed. If people told you things like that, you're happy with it. You're happy with that. You know, you're a big stopper set at half and bang, 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 all this sort of thing. You're happy with that. Not, you know, that you could pass the ball well or you've got a great delivery on you. How many goals you set up? How many assists did you get? You know, you're not interested in that. You want, you want it to be the norm. I think so. Whereas nowadays, you don't want to be the norm. So that's, that's how much it's changed. One of the things that, that probably one of the first times you came to my attention was breaking through in a team that I'd quite liked, I quite admired Ipswich, but in the Ipswich I'm talking about before, when I'm guessing you were on the books, but it was before you, you made your debut. And I think that whether, whether or not it's fair to call you an Ipswich supporter, you'd been at there from such an early age or an age at which it became your club, in inverted commas. Where were you and what was the build up to the FA Cup final against Arsenal? What do you remember of that as, as and the buzz around the club and the day and well, what it meant? I was an Ipswich supporter. I always had been an Ipswich supporter. I came to Portman Road and, and watched them uh, under Bill McGarry in 1969 when I got promotion to the old First Division. So I'd stood on the terraces at the Churchman Inn now, which is the Sir Arthur Ramsey stand, I think it is. They've all changed their names now, but I associate them with the names I knew. And my dad made a milk crate, so my dad would take me down early, get there, right at the front, <laughs> behind the goals, with the, I'd stand on the milk crate. And I'll, Special I, feeling. I, I was small, it? yeah, I was smaller now. Just the head just above the, the arms, just above the, the parapet sort of thing, behind the goals. And the crowds, you know, you see if she's beat Barcelona there and the great Johan Cruyff came along and all that. So, you know, wow, some great times, great memories. Going to watch Ipswich play, replay against Leeds United at, at Leicester City on the Monday. And then they drew, had to go back on the Wednesday. And they lost that semi-final in, in 1975. And great memory. So, so for me to, to be part of, a, of the club, and I actually made my debut in two, I played two games before the cup final. April the 15th, 1978, April the 18th, and both in Liverpool. Once again, against Everton, Everton yeah. Yeah, one against, against Liverpool. Yeah. So I was never involved with the FA Cup team, although I was 13th man at uh, Millwall, which was an experience because that was when the, the Millwall fans all rioted and the Ipswich fans took a right batter in that day. They were throwing, Millwall fans were throwing glass bottles onto the roof of the standards coming down. And I was 13th man, and that meant you didn't play because there's only one substitute. And I got my clothes on on the bench. And the wounded are coming by me, all cuts. And all. It was horrible, horrific yeah. sight. But Ipswich won six one, and then got through to the semi final, which they won at Highbury against West Brom, and then the final itself. And I, I was, I wasn't in the squad, uh, but I was with all the, the the wives and girlfriends and staff and people at the club because you could get them all on one bus in those days. Nowadays you need a fleet, <laughs> so you, you you then go to Wembley, and we're at Wembley in the old Wembley, which is like the Twin Towers and all that unbelievable feeling seeing my club play at Wembley yeah. in the cup final. You know, it's, it's a dream come true. But we're on the staff, and of course we're getting all the beers and that, all, everybody's passing the beers along, so we're having the good food drinks as well. And, and the Ipswich won the cup, it still sends shivers down my spine now. Yeah. You know, we all got, all got on the buses, and the wives and girlfriends and staff, we all went back to the Royal Gardens Hotel in Kensington. Oh, God, where England um, celebrated the 66 World Cup. Well, that's quite ironic in a way, but we went back to, to that hotel. And Russell Osman, who was in the squad, but didn't play. Um, he played in every game, up to the semi-final and final. So me and Russell were roommates, so we got in the room and we went down to the banquet after a cup final. Now you, you always hear about banquets after cup finals, but to actually be a part of it and with your team, 
dream come true. Mm. So we're on the booze and all the champagnes and all that sort of thing, we're having a great night. So me and Russell, so they're passing around the cigars. So me and Russell go, oh, Romeo and Juliet, thanks very much. We'll have a few of them in the pocket. So then we start to, to try and smoke them, because you could smoke them in there. So try and smoke them, we couldn't get them lit. We were like puffing away, we were going red in the face. So it was only one later on when someone said to us, did you, did you cut the cigars? No, we just smoked, we just smoked them. Oh, you supposed to cut them. We tried to smoke cigars without even to cut them. Oh, it was a, we were laughing. But it was like, we felt, actually felt sick because we just tried to pump away. This isn't going to end well. No, so we had a right, right good night. And then um, we left earlier and then the team left. But going back to Ipswich and all the, all the bridges and all the, on the road, all the cars, and then going back to Ipswich is just phenomenal. And we, we came back to the town hall as well and Ipswich had the parade. We weren't part of that, we just, we just watched it. But we actually came back in the UEFA Cup in, in 81. So uh, I've opened top bus tour, so I've, I've done that. And it's just, it's just the most incredible thing. You, you never take that away from me and from the boys there and all that no. sort of thing. We've done that and it's, we've been there. It's just the most amazing thing. I, I remember, and I don't know if you, you know, what I want to tap into was this, because the point of the big interview is to, is to try and talk about football and the way that we all felt about it when we were fans. That's the ideal. Because I still think that's its most pure form. It's, it's why we're all doing this. I remember feeling that Britain almost fell in love with Ipswich then because the distinction I made is that you began to play a different style of football in the years after, particularly after, okay, you had emerged, you're a different football out the back, Russell emerged, you bought the two Dutchmen, there were other developments in the playing style. Only three, four years later, and that cup final team, maybe people didn't fall in love with Ipswich because it was as beautiful football as it subsequently became. But there was something about, um, it was a very lovable club. People knew that it was one of the smaller clubs in the big set at that time. To go down to London, to beat Arsenal, my memory as a 14, 15 year old was that Britain just absolutely fell head over heels. And at that stage, what I wasn't aware of was too that your, your manager then had been a very popular man in an England shirt. I'd not known at that stage that this was Alf Ramsey's club either, and you'd been champions in 62. So did you get a feeling from outside Ipswich in 78 that Britain was kind of pretty much in love with that Ipswich era? No, no, not, not so much really. I think, um, so Alf Ramsey was the first famous person's autograph I ever got. I met him in the street in Felixstowe with my dad, and we had to, he eventually got a receipt and a pen for him to sign. You know, he's the most magnificent guy. Didn't have a bowler hat on like he normally had, but he had a shirt and tie on. He's, I think he, he went to bed in a shirt and tie, but there we are. But wasn't, no. fo- wasn't fond of the Scots? No, he wasn't, I, no, I, not I, at I, all. <laughs> he, he, he was a lovely guy, but yes, there was, there was a sort of tradition in Ipswich, which, which Bobby then took on, but I wasn't too sure about how people took Ipswich, but for Ipswich to go down to, to London and play against like Malcolm McDonald's and yeah. Frank Stapleton's and uh, Alan Hudson's of this world and all that sort of thing, for a club like us, Having been with the players and been on the, been in the first team as well, you know everybody was like you know, you know just one big family and one one happy club. But a lot of the club players had come through together in the first team and also in the youth team and reserve team. They've all come through together. I mean, Bobby got this ma- magnificent conveyor belt of players coming through. I remember going to a pub on the way back because there was no food laid on. There was no training ground. There was a training pitch outside the, one of the stands at Ipswich, which everybody used. Three teams used. In I think August it was World War, mm-hmm. but. We ended up going to a pub, I think it was, was Mickey Mills, Clive Woods, Loris Sibbles, Roger Osborne's, and I think that was just before the semi-final. It was not so much that everybody fell in love with Ipswich, you could see the players thinking, oh my God, you know, we're, we're going to play in a semi-final now, you know, we, we're, you know, we shouldn't be here, it should be your Arsenals and your, and your Liverpools and Manchester United's of this world doing what we're going to do. And they went to, to Highbury on the Saturday, it was about the Thursday, went to Highbury on the Saturday, and beat West Brom 3-1, the most magnificent match, and we were all there again. Because you know, that, was a, that was a right good side you were beating then, a yeah, right really good, good side. Yeah. I mean, I, perhaps I got the idea of a bandaged bloody head from John Wilde, because mm. he ended up with a real bad cut head. I think it was Brian Talbot as well, Brian scored the goal and the clash of heads, but the most unbelievable day. And then the cup final itself, but to go down there and beat uh, the mighty Arsenal, and not just beat them, it was 1-0, it sounds a tight game. It wasn't a tight game. Ipswich dominated the game at the crossbar, at the post. Pat Jennings was in great form, probably the best player for Arsenal. But the actual, the actual team and the way that Ipswich played changed. I think we lost 6-1 at Villa on the previous Saturday. And I think that was the side Bobby wanted to play. Bobby Robson wanted to play in the cup final. But the players didn't want that. They wanted a certain team. But he changed the system to 4-3-3, mm-hmm. which is quite revolutionary in many yeah. respects. 
and he brought in David Geddes on the right wing and he ended up crossing the ball, Willie Young knocked it out, Roger Osborne scored. It was one of those, it was a radical system in a way that Arsenal couldn't cope with it, but Ipswich were confident and that was only worked on in the week of the cup final, it wasn't worked on before that. So it says a lot for the players and for the staff and for Bobby and Bobby, Fer and Bobby Fergus and Cyril Lees of the coaches that they actually implemented that really so late that the players just took that on board and went out and, and produced a, a fantastic performance. And then after that, after that cup final in 78, Arnold Muren came, Franz Tyson came, Brian Talbot was sold to Arsenal. The whole system of the team changed around because I remember Arnold Muren coming to Ipswich and we lost 3-0. I wasn't in the team, I was, just, I was in the reserves at the time. Ipswich lost 3-0 to Liverpool. But Ipswich played in, in like, they knocked the ball forward. And that's how they, Ipswich used to play a lot, get the ball forward, hot long balls. And Arnold Muren said, I can't play in this team because I'm not getting the ball. You know, and I'm, I'm a person that needs the ball. It's just like a tennis match. The whole system changed around radically and it was built around a player called Eric Gates. Mr. Punch, we call him, because he's a very similar nose, I think, and chin. <laughs> With all due respect to Gacy, but... <laughs> too late. It, too late, yeah, but it was... Uh, we all revolved around him but playing in that hole, that little diamond uh, system. Not like a 10 in the Italians, not, not a creative 10, but finding a gap between a, a main striker and the midfield. He was a midfield player that could score goals and could make goals. And he then used to have a licence to run wherever he wanted to, because... You had Arnold Muren, Johnny Walk, and Franz Tyson as a midfield three. Mm -hmm. And John Walk sat in front of, you, of the two centre halves. And that enabled your full backs to get forward, very similar to what England were doing under Roy Hodgson uh, when he first came in and all this kind of thing. It's, it's hard to play against if the team is, knows the system well and plays it well. Johnny Walk sat in front of the back four, and he scored a hatful of goals, a hatful of goals. And he was our defensive midfield player, like a Makaleli or someone that sits in front, Johnny with McCall, things like this. But he scored an unbelievable amount of goals from that position. So it was a very fluid system, but everybody knew their jobs. And it was, I think that was what Bobby was very good at, was you know, defining what you had to do and do it well. That's what I was going to ask you, because the, the way in which that era has been defined subsequently is, ex is exactly how you said it, that the, the two Dutchmen in particular come, probably not only Ipswich changes, but everybody around has a little look and says, well... We'd like players like that, we'd like to be able to play in that style, let's go and buy footballers of that ilk. But maybe Tyson and Muren came to a club that even though the, the actual brand of football had to change, that this was the right club for them, given the brand of football that had been played in the 60s. The, Bobby's adaptability, we're going to talk about Bobby Robson a lot because you knew him really well, I, he treated me really well in my career and I liked him a lot, so I'd like to talk about him, but he does carry particularly from his foreign clubs, an idea that maybe one of his biggest characteristics wasn't necessarily tactical brilliance, but he did have, from what you've said, the ability to adapt and learn and change, and he wasn't a guy who was like, the rigid and you only do it this way. He was flexible and adaptable. Well, I mean, we didn't always play with a diamond. We'd, we'd change things around, but you know, the players liked it and it worked well because it gave the other team a problem from their back four. Do they move one out of the back four to mark Eric Gates because he was in behind the midfield? Do they bring a midfield player back that gave Johnny Walk more room? So it straight away set problems for the, for the teams. Very similar to Graham Taylor, in a sort of slightly different way. Graham Taylor, when he was at Watford, when they played two men at the back and four midfield and four up front, you knew what they had to do, but you had to deal with it. So it was, it was up to you. I still think he was tactically very good, but what Bobby used to do, he'd put it to one side and he was very good at man management. He'd speak to you and to say to you about what you've done well, how's the family, because he knew all about your family and what you, what you needed, what you did. Because I used to get loans from him. I used to, rather than go to the bank or the building society, I'd knock on the McGaffer's door if I was moving house or things like this. I'd say, look, you know, is it possible to get a loan? The same rates as the, as the bill. I'd rather give the money to his town mm -hmm. than I would to. So we used to get mortgages on the house, things like this, used to come through the club, which was brilliant because it obviously tied it to the club. Yeah. But it was great that the, you know, the gaffer would listen to that. And, he, and if, if you ever had a problem, you'd, you'd speak to him. You could do that. He, he wasn't in so much awe of him. It was, he was the gaffer. But he was also your uncle or your granddad, and you'd go and have a chat with him and things like this. But he'd, he'd take you to one side, and he'd, it was always positive with Bobby. It was never negative. It was always really positive. And he you know, was a bit absent-minded with names and things like this. He'd always call me butcher you know, and things like this. But you wanted to do it for him. You know, you had that feeling that he was the gaffer. You know, he was not a god of the club, but he was, he was somebody that, you know, if you did well for him, you know you got praise. I like to live a little bit. I like to make use of the time we've been given. So I live with a bit of colour and a bit of passion but I've never been around anybody who was as much in love with life as as much fun and he, I don't know what it was but when you were near him he kind of gave off a, a jauntiness and a and a sense of humor and that life wasn't one big big joke by any means at all but like you you felt like he was a guy who could literally cope with anything 
and take it in his stride. Well, he did see he, the positive. He had to cope with everything to deal with us because we just <laughs> threw a lot of stuff at him. Don't worry about that. Because uh, we were quite um, secretive with our drinking sessions and sometimes not quite so secretive. So, well, Bobby would never join in. No, Bobby wasn't a big drinker, or didn't, not to us. But he. he he used to uh, pick up the pieces sort of thing and see the players, but he knew what was going on. I mean, he had, he had to know what was going on. We'd have a few, a good few drinks. Uh, Who were the ringleaders? Everybody, everybody joined in. I mean, we used to go to the Ipswich Arms, which was the pub, uh, just after the game on a Saturday, and then they had a paper, local paper called the Green and the Ipswich, yeah. and the pink and the orange of the Green and the Ipswich. And you'd read the Green and you read about the game and reports and all that sort of thing. Did the, the, did the guys, the press guys who you knew very well, did they slaughter you, did they praise you, whatever? So I'm, I'm in there one day, and Mariner's in there, because about 10, 11 of the boys were in there, a few pints and that before going home after the game. It was really good, because you go in the players' range, and they're always packed, so you go into the pub. It's really sad, so now gone. So I'm in, I'm in the pub, and uh, Mariner's had brought Ian Gillen along from Deep, from Deep Purple. So, I mean, he's an absolute superstar. And the next thing I know, I'm reading the green, and the next thing I know, it's on fire. <laughs> Gillen's got a lighter and lit it in the middle of the pub. What do you do? What do you do with the lit paper, the paper that's on fire? What do you do with it? I, I don't know what to do. I, so I, I ran to the bar and they, they, they got a tray of water or something, a jug of water, and put up the water on it. You, know, you, mean, you never poured your beer, that's the main not thing. No, no, no. I wouldn't do that. No, I wouldn't do that. That was the trap I think you were setting. Oh, you know, I mean, setting that was unbelievable. But I mean, we'd organise nights out and things like this, and days out, but sometimes impromptu. But after games, yeah, we'd, we'd, we'd go out normally. There'd be about seven, eight players with their wives and girlfriends go out to restaurants on, on, a, on a Saturday night. Sometimes we meet Sunday lunch down the Centre Spot restaurant, which is one of the restaurants at, at, the, at the ground. And uh, yeah, it was, it was just incredible. It was, it was a buzz because it got you together. But Bobby knew all about that. And he came to me once and he said to me, you have a safety valve, Butcher. I'm not Terry, but Butcher. You have a safety valve. And I says, oh, do I have a... <laughs> I wonder where he's going with this. He says, yeah. He says, he says your safety valve is alcohol. And I says, oh, right. He says, yeah. He says, if you, if you want to escape and if you want to, to go, so you, you have a few drinks. That's your safety valve. And I says, all right. So that, I thought, wow. I thought, was that a rollicking or was that a praise or what, what was that? It feels like that was him working out what he was going to say to you, whether yeah. he was going to allow it or not. And he's going to himself, no, no, no. If I let him have that, then I want to get what I want on the pitch from him. Does that I, sound fair? No, to, well, to me it was, it was like, well, just be careful. It was like, I no know, more, I know about much. it, but don't, don't be stupid about it. But it didn't stop me, but there we go. <laughs> was, he, was he much of a disciplinarian? I, I... Yeah, he was, yeah. He was, he was, quite, he was quite tough. Uh, or sometimes really? very tough, yeah. Very tough. I mean, he, <laughs> I remember 1990 in the World Cup, there's a great story about with Gazza and Chrissy Waddle where we've organised a players' night out. This is like four days before the Republic of Ireland game in Sardinia. So we've, me and Chris Woods did a bit of a recce a few days before, found the bar. So he said to Chrissy Waddle, come on, Chrissy Waddle and Gaza, come on, let's go down there for a few drinks. So the work got about, and in the end, it was about nine or ten of us, like John Barnes and Brian Robson and everybody else. Chris Woods was my roommate, so we all went down, organised the cars, got down there and came back. As we came back at midnight, wherever it was, you know, because you think you're invisible, we had a good few, about six or seven pints, because it was a bit stir-crazy in the World Cup yeah. prior to the first game. Brian Robson's gone up to Gaza's room, tried to lift his bed, and as he's lifted his bed, the bed that Gaza's on, Gaza fell out of bed, the bed slid along the tile floor and took his right toenail half off. Oh, yeah. his, 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 his right foot, his, his big toenail. Yeah. Blood everywhere. Gaza says, uh, stick it in the bidet. So Brian Pop puts it in the bidet and Gaza turns on the hot tap, which made it even worse. <laughs> so then the doctors have to be called. We're, we're all asleep, obliviously. So anyway, the next, that next morning, half eight, Don out on the door. Team meeting, team meeting, and I'm like, oh, we've been rumbled, we've been rumbled here, because you've got a bit of a thick head. So we go all the way down, team meeting, and Bobby went right through us. He went right through us. You have wrecked your chances. The captain of your country could be out of the World Cup. How am I going to explain that to the, to the press? He says, I'm going to go in the room next door, and I want you all to come through in that room. He said, all come through, those that were out. He says, and apologise to me, and apologise to your country. So I said, oh, right. So, so I said to Woodsy, come on, Woodsy, we're going. He says, I'm not going. I said, well, you're not going. He says, he says, all right for you. He says, you've had an international career. Mine could be over. He said, I'm not having one yet. Mark, man. So, so you think, uh, I've got, so I'm going to go through. So I went through to the next door. And I had a bit of a beard at the time because I, I think I was on the verge of not playing and all that sort of thing in the World Cup, 1990. So, because Mark Wright was there and Des Walker was yeah. there. And I said, it was yeah. a really good squad. Yeah. So uh, I go through. And then Chrissy Waddle standing behind Bobby Robson with Gazza. Bobby Robson sat down, because they've been in first, and they've obviously sat, so. 
it would Bobby Rob went through me. I knew it would be you. You're always a ringleader. You've got this problem with alcohol. And that. So he went through me. And, oh, I said, I'm really sorry, Gaffer, and all that sort of thing. And humbly apologised, which I did, and all that sort of thing. And then Gaz is behind the gaffer and he's making faces at me. I'm getting angry and, I, and, I, and he's being some stupid face, so I start laughing. And it made Bobby worse because it's, it's not a funny thing. It's no laughing matter, but you and all this way. So anyway, he finished it off. He said, and then what he, his finishing line was, and another thing, Butcher, you're ugly. <laughs> of course, Gaz are in Christy Waddle, just burst out laughing. <laughs> And he says, right, now go, clear off, and bring the next ones in. And I don't know who else, who else came. I went, I, Gazza went out before me, and I've chased Gazza around the pool trying to kill him. I got hold of him eventually and batted him, but I, I thought I mean, you were... Only Bobby could go. Only Bobby could do that. Like, yeah. the there, was a, there, there was an expletive there, so I didn't put it in. And you were beep, beep, ugly. <laughs> but he used to... But he was so funny. Some of the things he used to say it would just, it just make you laugh. He didn't deliberately be funny, but sometimes <laughs> the, he used to say the funniest things and we'd be, we'd be rolling around laughing and all that sort of so What was it with him and names? How on earth? You know, because he was a bright, intelligent, curious man. All, I mean, look, look, look what the heck he did in having gone abroad and won trophies in Portugal, Holland, yeah. Spain, but he couldn't get names. What, what, did that not seem a bit strange? The famous one no, is it's, that it's he's, he's, he's yeah. manager of England. In the lift. Brian's yes. Captain of England, Bobby comes down and morning, Bobby. <laughs> no, morning, morning, Brian. Mor no, morning, Bobby. Morning, Bobby and Brian's Brian like, no, no boss. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I'm Brian, you're yeah, Bobby. That's true. Because they used to, there's another story about him in the World Cup in 1986. We went to Colorado Springs for high altitude training, mm -hmm. the Air Force Academy uh, base and that sort of thing, top gun base. So we were there and having, having a great time, F fantastic facility. He comes along, he says, uh, I forgot my boots. Everybody got size nine boots, that they spare ones. So Glenn Ola said, yeah, I've got a brand new pair, Bobby. Boom, I think Adidas, I think they went through him and he caught it. So we did a two hour session, which we were doing then to acclimatize for, for Mexico. And Bobby comes back in, he goes, he says, he threw, him, threw it back at Glenn. He says, they're never nine. He says, that's a number upside down, it should be six. She says, you're joking, they're brand new. He says, I know, but my feet, you're killing me. So Glenn has a look and in, in the, because they're brand new boots, in the boots, it's still the paper. <laughs> and it, it then the whole train, Bobby had read about the whole training session with a paper in the boots. It was sensational. I mean, they're legendary tales, but the players love him more for it because at the end of the day, he doesn't mean to be funny. And he's, but he said some of the things he said and did, you honestly are priceless. They really were. But that bonded you towards him even more because it was like, you know, there but for the grace of God go I sort of thing. Sometimes he said, and he used to have his sayings. My saying, he said, ask you for your saying. What's your saying, Butcher? What's your saying? Um, whoever it was, you know, what you're saying, with it, you know, you're saying was for the trip. Mine was, if you can't win the first header, win the second header. You know, if you can't win the first header, win the second header in both boxes, because it sticks with you. And I think he's, one of the players, I think it was um, to Alvin Martin, I think it was, or someone, says, if you're in possession, you can be out of position. But if you're out of possession, you must be in position. If you're, out of pos if you're in possession, you, you can, can be, be out, out of position. position. Therefore, you move. Yeah. But if you're out of possession, you must be in position. But and it, because it, 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 I think it was, uh, it was either Terry Fennick or Alvin Martin. So he, uh, yeah, got this, got this. And he would try and say it to be clever. And I, honestly, he must have been ten minutes trying to get it right. And, and the players are rolling the road, they're laughing. But I've known this as a manager. Sometimes, if you take the Mickey out of yourself or you do something wrong, yeah. and the players laugh at you, yeah. it can actually have a good effect because the players they don't think you're stupid. But they actually, they actually, it's, it's humorous and it's funny, and they, they talk about it, and it's a laugh. It's not, it's not derogatory. I mean, I was like, that doesn't demean you, but it's quite funny because the, the gaffer's fallible. He's not, you know, perfect. You know, it's, it's funny, but he takes the Mickey out of himself because he, he says like, ah, he says, we'll leave that one. We'll go with someone else. That's it. He, was, he did that exasperated thing, and it didn't matter to me. Never. He would. I've never seen him embarrassed by anything. And if something, if he made a muddle or something, he just moved on with a laugh. But and he a always, joke. if he's, he should say, because he used to get, ma he got a massive stick in 1990 because he, he was going to leave and all that. It wasn't his contract yeah. was going to be renewed and all that. Sort of. Yeah. So he's going to PSV. So he said, he said, well, I'm not going to speak to them. I'm going to give him five minutes of the time. That's it. I can't stand them. I want to speak to them. That's it. 35 minutes later, he's still there, and he's, he still hasn't finished. Once he got talking and once he got going, he would, he would, he would talk, but he loved talking about football. That's, that's how we, we did. That's how we started, because, you know, I, I, you make me laugh, and you make me feel the affection I had for him in the little time I knew of him, but, so I'm jealous of all the time you had with him, but in the little time I had with him, you know, I said, Joe, nobody. I Scott, more to boot coming down to England. That's, that's his phrase. 
I've got possession of it. It's phrased to me, no matter when I saw him, it was on the phone, I'm very busy. I don't have enough time for you. I, I can speak, though. And it would be like, he'd be sitting doing nothing or he would be busy, but it was always like, I'm very busy, all right. And two hours later, we'd still be talking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, could, yeah. you possibly couldn't get rid of him if you, if you were on football. And it culminated in, when he won the cup with Barcelona in the Bernabeu in Madrid Stadium against Betis in a really sort of colossal game, 3-2, I think it was, after extra time. So the camp now, him, the Barca, 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 gets played in the Bernabeu because that's where the cup final is. He's already known for a couple of months that they've cheated and lied to him, Barcelona, and that Van Hal's going to take over and he's going to move upstairs and he's, he's hurt. But he goes to the victory, on the Saturday night at the game, he says to me, ah, yeah, I'll give you an interview, no problem at all. I say, tomorrow, tomorrow, back in Barcelona, Sunday, okay. So, so I phone him up, breakfast time, oh no, I'm, I'm quite busy, okay. I'm going to do this first, phone me at lunchtime, phone him at lunchtime. Well, we're on the open top bus now and I can't do it. See you tonight at the team hotel on the Sunday night at the dinner. Okay, super. So we finally, I'm worried because I trust him. I don't, I'm not, and it's a big interview because the British manager's won the cup in Spain. He's also won the Cup Winners Cup and he's won the Super Cup. And you know he's going to be bumped and it's unfair. Celtic have made him a big offer, but nobody's sure what's happening. And he sits down and he gives me an hour conversation in the Ray Juan Carlos Hotel when all of the club, all the top brass and the sponsors, the players are up in the dining hall. We're down in the reception, and he started giving me this interview, and it's very good. And yes, Celtic offered me the manager's job, and this is why I'm taking it. And I'm going to take their money. They've stiffed me. They've, they've bumped me out. So I'm going to become the most expensive scout in world football, and I'm going to live on their expense. And the president's angry because they want to start, and they send his assistant down. They send just a young Jose Mourinho down. Boss, boss, you have to come up the president. Let the president wait. They've sacked me. I'm talking to my friend. We'll finish the interview. And he deliberately keeps talking for another half hour. Now, I mean, imagine the impact on somebody like me mm. for somebody like that to do, to do that for you. It was fun. And when he came back and he talked to me about the power of going back to Newcastle, I, I could see when we exchanged a text, I asked you what was it about him, and you talked about the inspirational values and how people would do anything for him. I found him just an extraordinary man. What he also did as well, he got the, he got the wives and girlfriends involved with the, with, the, with the England team when it came to the tournaments. Nothing was done in 82 because uh, it was, England hadn't been to a World Cup for some state for some time. So there, there was nothing organised for the wives in, in Spain. So my wife came out, Rita came out with my son Christo, who was only 12 weeks old. Gosh. And he came out and um, I think, um, what was it, who else was uh, Kenny Sanson's wife? Graham Brooks' wife, Glenn Hoddle's wife, they all came out as well. Mm -hmm. So there was a nice little core of wives there. Yep. Um, and then we moved on to Madrid for the second phase and all that sort of thing. So uh, well, we did it off our own back and paid for it and all that sort of thing. The players paid for it themselves. 86, when we went out to Mexico, we went to the Air Force Academy before the wives came out there. Gosh. Before we went to Mexico. We then flew up to Canada, played a game, then, then down for the World Cup. So the wives come together before and in 1990 as well. So he, he made it. He made it a really special thing. So he always was a family, you know, a family man. He wanted you to feel happy and relaxed. He had your fun with the wives, and we'd have time off as well, and it was very relaxed. But not when it came to actually in the World Cup. Mm -hmm. And I remember a story when uh, in 1990 we just we just beaten uh, Cameroon. We luckily beaten Cameroon three two, but whatever it was, we got through. And, and we, we didn't know the impact of the World Cup back home because you, you're insulated and away from things yeah. over there. So we're sitting by the pool in, in the Sorrento, I think it was, you know, on the, on the was it Amalfi Coast or whatever, it was a beautiful place. Yeah. So we're sitting by the pool and listening to my hypnotherapy tapes and all this sort of thing, and, and Bobby comes along and says, sit down beside me. And I says, uh, it's the night before, great night, how are the boys? And I said, oh, they're fine, Gaffer, they're really good. Um, everything's going well. And so I said, look, I've got to speak to you about the wives coming out. Yeah, we'll get that sorted out, no problems at all. Uh, he says, um, he says, but you know, what, what do the players think about you know playing, playing against the, the Germans and playing this on that? I says, well, I'm fine, boss. I went through that. I went through a lot about a five or ten minute conversation, you know, talk. And I look round and he's he's fell asleep and he's snoring. <laughs> he's snoring away. And I thought, he's he's asked my opinion and he's just gone to sleep. So I thought, I knew I was boring, but not that boring. So I thought, right, you're going to get this. So I, I put me headphones on. So I went up to the, to the side of the pool because we were up by the side of the pool. And I jumped right in the water near him and <laughs> soaked him and woke him up. I thought that'll teach him to fall asleep on my in my conversation. But it was funny. And that, right at the end God of the tournament, him. obviously with a third and fourth place playoff in Bari, we, we you captain by now because Robson's injured. Yeah, I'm captain for the semi final, but yeah. I didn't play in the third and fourth place because my knees were when yeah. he was bad, needed a knee operation. 
So after the game, we, everybody, everybody said, right, we're going to, uh, we're going to get the gaffer in the pool, throw him in the pool. He, he always had the suit on, you know, the, mm. the England suit, fantastic. He was very proud of that. Yeah. So we got him as a gift as well, a presentation. The last game as England manager, third and fourth place playoff. You know, the boys just want to say a big thank you. Or well, the wives are there around the, around the pool in the evening. Drink was flying and everything like that. So I think, so he says, right, I'm going to, I says to the players, I'm going to grab the gaffer and then we're both of us going to go in the pool. So I'd sacrifice him to go in the pool. <laughs> But I want, you know, that'd be a great thing. Okay, fine. So then I've grabbed him on the, on the, on the command, I've grabbed him. And as I've, as I've gone towards the pool, someone's pushed me in and it's a big, it's a big scrum, so then to push the gaffer in. As I'm going towards, heading towards the pool, I've got the gaffer in my arms. And the next thing I see is a diving board, the little diving of the springboard. Little, that, and we're heading towards that. And I'm thinking, oh my God. And the gaffer, Bobby Robson's head just must have missed it by an inch. I thought, I'm going to kill the England manager as I was going to the pool. I'm going to kill him, I'm going to kill him. Oh, boom. And as I came up, I thought, I'm going to see him floating on the surface. Is he alive? Not a great career move. No, not good at all. And, but luckily, we just, just missed it. I was like, oh my God. I was really close. But yeah, he, but he took it really well. He, he loved like, things like that with the players as well. In the background, you, you've possibly heard the Market Square clock chiming three maybe you didn't maybe you heard a little bit of background sound in this old creaky wonderful victorian building because we're in the town hall in ipswich city center the very place where terry and eric gates and bobby robson and mariner and brazil paraded the uefa cup in 1981 the same place i suppose that they paraded the league title in 1962 when alf ramsey was the manager just imagine what it meant when you listen to the passion in Terry's voice about the 1978 FA Cup, just imagine for a minute what it felt like to him to take the club he supported to that European glory. Terry's a brilliant raconteur. There'll be more. In fact, thanks to you, there'll be more for over a year now. We will go on finding people like this of different nationalities who tell football stories this well, and I hope entertaining you very much indeed. Thanks for being there. Thanks to Backpage for producing this, for making it happen. Thanks to Alex Aidy, who makes it sound fantastic. Beer Jacket, just like beer, are always there for us. And you have been too. We love you. <laughs>